Mark is the air that I personally breathe. He's the energy that allows my life to continue forward. And as a symbol for education, he is the symbol for me of mind and intellect. He is the symbol for our struggle. And now in the twilight of his life, he's trying to put 60 plus years of the energy that he has put into our struggle into a type of focus that we can understand and take it forward into the future. Many of you have known him longer than me. I have had the pleasure of having many visits and conversations with him over the last 10 or 12 years. We speak just about every other week on the telephone. He stayed in my home, and again, he is a very important inspiration to me and to us all. So with that in mind, I don't see him standing in the doorway. He's coming. Uh, but I would like to stop and have us greet our master teacher, Professor John Henry Clark. Thank you. I appreciate being here again. I appreciate being asked to speak in a city not too far from the one that I grew to early manhood in Columbus, Georgia. Not terribly far from that little half a horse town called Union Springs in Alabama where I was born. I appreciate returning to the South and participate in the continuous change. I have no illusions about the South changing to the point where it's not all of what it used to be when I lived here. It is still part of what it used to be, though there's been some cosmetic changes. <laughs> a cosmetic change, it's almost like a lady's makeup. Take it off. <laughs> I'll forget about it. Some days you don't wear it. <laughs> now the subject for tonight is a subject that a lot of people have stayed away from because for academic reasons, for tenure reasons, for job reasons, for personal relations reasons, they have not wanted to discuss the African Revolution. They have not wanted to call it a revolution. They have not been willing to say why it failed. They're not willing to say what will have to be done to make it succeed. If we are now a people at the crossroads of history, then we are not at the crossroads only of our history, we are at the crossroads of human history. We are on the cutting edge, edge of the history of man. Then why have we not asked the question? A people so potentially powerful have so little power. A people the most diverse people spread throughout the world. There's not a human society in the world where we have not touched and influenced. Why then, 
if we are the rightful owners of a piece of real estate called Africa, 12 million square miles full of the richest mineral God ever created, God in nature, and for me, God in nature is one and the same. Why then are we so poor? Who's managing our wealth? Who's managing us as we mismanage our wealth? How dare we call ourselves an independent people with independent state when the only way you can be independent you must manage all of the wealth producing resources of the country that you own. I'm not talking about a country you invaded. I'm talking about the country that is the historical geography of your early development and birth. Why do we own so much and manage so little? And why is there so much confusion among us based on pure man-made nonsense? And why do we go to war with each other over organized religions without understanding that all organized religions were brought to countries by farmers, bakers, and fools? You had a way of life, a spiritual way of life, superior to all organized religions. Before, why then did you let foreigners bring to you something that puts you against your own brother, made you go to war against your own brother, Turn your back while foreigners rape your sister and your mother and enslave your brother and do it in the name of a God they taught you and neglected the God you created. Something happened to your mind. You programmed yourself into a position where any foreigner with any kind of strength could take over the destiny of your country. There are countries in Africa right now so weak, a good Boy Scout troop could take them over. <laughs> what is the excuse? When you find the strongest thing about a people, look on the flip side and you'll find the weakest. The strongest thing about African people throughout the world is their ability to be hospitable to strangers, to recognize the humanity of the stranger. The weakest side about African people is that too many times they are more kind to the stranger than to the relative. <laughs> They invite the stranger for dinner and forget that they haven't even fed their children. Yeah. It's a kind of kindness that's open to question. Now, what am I talking about? African people at the crossroads talking about an African revolution that should occur that did not occur in its true sense. African people at the crossroads, cro at what crossroads? The crossroads of human history, talking about the golden opportunity you missed because you could not find yourself on the map of human geography. And you kept identifying yourself with other people Sometimes other people who are failures. You couldn't go to Africa and understand the nature of the social systems in Africa 
that not only predates Karl Marx, it predates Europe itself. Now you got to go and get the European version of socialism. <laughs> you can't read enough. Go back and understand that an African pharaoh of Naden, 1,300 years before the birth of Christ, announced the same theory from a throne and practiced it. The European announced the theory and betrayed it. Every humane theory that the European has ever announced, he has betrayed it. Christianity, Marxism, democracy, humanity, he never lived up to any of this, and yet you are following like a fool behind him with an empty <coughs> basket, think you're gonna collect some of his things in order to make something for yourself and neglecting the richness of your own that you need to cultivate. Right. Right. Now, if you knew his history, you wouldn't follow after him. That if you knew the history of the Arabs, you wouldn't follow Arab Islam. You would understand that two Africans made Islam. Right. Zayd bin Harith and Bilal. That's right. And that Ethiopia nursed Islam in its cradle and saved it. Right. When they're about to be driven out of Arabia, Prophet Muhammad said, go to Ethiopia, go to that land where no one is wrong. And he went to Ethiopia as Africa, hospitable to strangers, let, let his followers in, gave them a haven. After the death of the prophet, they went back and got the faith well on the way. Now you think that you've got to propagate, purify, and sell us Arabism, which is not Islam, because the Arab is a betrayer of Islam. You don't know who he is. He's part of the dirty waste matter that came down from the back door of Europe and united with the waste matter from the side door of Africa in the back door of Europe. He's the bastard child of a bastard child. Now you got to follow him. When he came to Africa, the Africans thought, because it was during the period of the Romans, that the Arabs and Islam would help to get the Romans off of they're back. They were right. But the Arabs got Rome off of their back. The Arabs replaced the Romans on their back. And he's still there. A vulture, a slave trader, a raper. I'm not against Islam or any religion. But I'm willing to condemn at the risk of my life any religion that says their God endorses the slave trade. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. Africans are being killed in Marita enslaved in Mauritania right now. Africans are being enslaved in, in the Sudan right now. Africans are being driven out of Mauritania who are Muslims because they wanted a pure Arab nation. Senegal is more Islam, Islamic, than Arabia. But yet the Senegalese Muslims being driven out. A whole lot of people in the Sudan who call themselves Arabs just black-skinned Africans converted to the faith and now turn against and enslaving their own people. And when you can't say anything about this, 
then you hide it behind the skirt of God, letting your own people be mutilated. Now, if we are at the crossroads of history, history is about to change. I am not telling any of you to leave a church or to leave a mosque or to leave a religion. I am telling you every single thing that touches your life, every social thing, every political thing, every cultural thing, must be converted into an instrument of liberation or be thrown into the ash can of history. You have no time to waste. When you've got to deal with Christianity, remember, we did not follow European type Christianity. And to the extent that we followed it, we went wrong. When we created the independent African church, it was a church totally different from the European church. It nurtured us have to give us some of our first schools. The church was once the schoolhouse. The church was once the place we hid from the law. The church was once the place we went to when we had no visible means of support. The church was once the place we went because we didn't send our people to insane asylum, to take care of mental health. The church, for all purpose, the church went back to the African spirituality before foreigners interfered with our spiritual way of life and started giving us some European garbage disguised as Christianity when it was a handmaiden of their conquest. Christianity became the handmaiden of European conquest Islam became the handmaid of Arab conquest. Now, listen to this statistic, and maybe you sober down and stop telling that damn Arab lie about Islam being the black man's true religion and black, Arab being the black man's true language. Islam is an AD religion. Not a BC. The Arabs are an AD people. We had religion and language 5,000 years before the birth of Christ. If you live to talk. That's right. <laughs> Why did I qualify? Why did I qualify? If I was much younger and made a statement like that, I would have my buddies at the door, one in front of the stage, in case I run for my life, I'd be able to get out of the building. <laughs> My qualification, if he lived at all. Now, if you read John Jackson's Pagan Origins of the Christ Myth, he traced the Christ story through 26 civilizations, each with their separate Christ, each a thousand miles apart. You only know about one. Every nation has, every major people have their own Christ, their own Christ concept. If you read a little pamphlet by Joe Massey, the historical Jesus and the mystic Christ, he examined the historical origins. Now if you read another book by John Jackson written before his death, Christianity before Christ. What's he talking about? <coughs> He's talking about <coughs> the fact that Africans practiced the same religion, the identical religion, and did not betray it. Thousands of 
thousands of years before Christ. And he explains what St. Augustine meant when he talking about the conference at Nicaea said that these people are trying to give us a religion we had 3,000 years ago. What's he talking about? <laughs> and we had it 3,000 years ago, then we had it long before Christ. A lot of people do not understand that you got to make a distinction between organized religion and a spiritual way of life. The African had a spiritual way of life that predates organized religion. This spiritual way of life was so good and orderly. He had entire societies that did not have the word jail in their language because no one had ever gone to one. All right, then how, what did happen? The family structure was so good. Within the family, they had judge, jury, all of this built into the family. The family structure was a miniature nation. Everyone who came into Africa declared war on this structure. One of the people that declared war on the structure, the last and most disastrous, was the Arabs. He is a major womanizer. You must never touch one of his, but yours is free country for him. Study the Gulf War. <clears throat> when America went there, they told America that I'll be for you. But the certain condition, if your soldiers want any prostitutes, you better bring them with you because there'll be no Arab women converted to prostitution. And if any of your women walk around here in skimpy dress, we we'll take the rest of the offer and, and beat her behind. You don't walk around here no many, many bathing suit. <laughs> America bathed to the left. And yet, right now, there are African women enslaved who work in the field, our farms in the day, and serve them in the bed at night on their command. <laughs> now, when you fail to do anything about this and keep quiet about this, you're more than a coward and a hypocrite. You're a liar in history because you do not understand. Remember, it was in Africa that we gave women something which we intelligently conceded that was hers all along. Preference and equality. It was in Africa that the woman rode at the head of her army. It was in Africa that the woman headed a state for the first time. It was in Africa that a woman became a god for the first time. You get hung up with white women's lives and got a damn thing to do with you at all. Our crisis at the crossroads that we are debating everybody's concern except our own. We're hung up with everybody's religion except our own creation. No one creates any liberation movement for you. <laughs> Slaves are never liberated. Freedom is something you take with your own hands. Or you don't get it.
we have encountered some misconceptions in history based on foreign invasions of Africa, based on our misreading of other people's literature that downgraded us, based on our acceptance of other people's words that's not applicable to us. We were never a minority. We number a billion people on the face of the earth. We should make jobs for each other. Now, let us start with simplicity. We don't need high tech right now. Let us start making our underwear. All right. That's something you change every day you can. <laughs> Out of underwear. Out of factories. Got to open up 10 factories at once. I made this proposal in New York at a memorial for Martin Luther King, what Martin Luther in a speech called, What Martin Luther King Did Not Learn About Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> Then I said, maybe if Martin suggests that we should not bury our beloved one in a coffin we don't make, we can take the coffin business away from the mafia and put some brothers to work building coffins. Coffins not even made out of fresh rate wood. And a second rate co carpenter can make a decent coffin. Ain't no high tech. I'm not talking about everybody got to go to engineering school now. <laughs> Why you buy all your coffins from somebody else? <laughs> With all the undertakers you've got, you mean we can't have one factory making coffins? <laughs> huh? We can't be self-sustained doing nothing? <laughs> Don't tell me you can't make a handkerchief. <laughs> Look, I've known Farrakhan for 40 years. I like him personally, and yet I have a running argument with him. He announces too much. It's an announcement and nothing more. A lot of ceremony without substance. He avoids too many issues. What are you talking about marching a million people on? men on Washington. How many pairs of shoes you a million men wear? How much gas it going to take? How many hotels going to hold you? All you're doing is making white people rich. And I suppose you save all that money and all that energy. You can build 300 supermarkets. But building a supermarket is less glamorous than before a camera posing on a march. I'm saying we suffer a disease where we have no doctors to cure. That disease is called ego starvation. We have a lot of ego starved people when they get see a camera, they get hungry. Oh my God, let me get before that camera. Let me see my face. When the constructive work of building a nation is not being done, you start building a nation by creating the things essential to your existence. That's right. That's right. Why not say, I won't wear any shoelaces I don't make? Now, don't tell me you can't make a shoelace. Do the basic, do the durable things first. High tech later. A simple automobile. Don't even buy a whole automobile. Buy the parts and assemble them. The brothers assemble them and got a job. Any good charge, you tell them how to assemble them. The very soon the brother's going to be doing it so well, before you go ask him, hey, bro, you want a job? Got one for you. 
You do it faster than me. If you're skillful, they hire you. People turn your way or call you back. We've forgotten our skill. We've forgotten what we did without interference. We've forgotten we produced societies that had no misery. We lived out our Christianity and our socialism. We didn't preach about it, we just lived it out. And we discovered something very early in life that a lot of us have gone away from. Spirituality and not religion is the enduring thing for man, a spiritual belief. Organized religion gives you a ceremony creates a rationale for what it does to other people. Spirituality did not succeed because with spirituality you can't hustle. No pew, no priest with fine pipe, no Cadillac. <laughs> what you gonna take a collection for? With spirituality, every person is his own preacher. Right. Certain people are guides. After a while, when certain people learn more than others, and this person comes to the spiritual forefront, if he wants his sandals, we make his sandals. If he wants to travel, we give him potter to take him from one place to the other. So what are they going to take our money for? Want book, we, we get him book. So this is why spirituality fell behind and organized Christianity came to the front. It came to the front because it was an interesting hustle disguised as a spiritual way of life. But Islam came out of Arabia. They came out as conquerors. They violated the very word of the prophet. The very Ethiopia that had saved them. The prophet said on his deathbed, Islam would never forsake Ethiopia when Ethiopia is in distress. Right before your eyes in your own time, an Islamic zealot, Qaddafi, armed little Eritrea, who destroyed the political effectiveness of Ethiopia. No nation has suffered more at the hands of Islam than Ethiopia. And yet the prophet has said, Islam will never forsake Ethiopia when Ethiopia is in distress. In practice, this is as big a lie as Christianity that helped to bring in slave, the slave trade. Now, I'm not telling you to leave religion. I'm saying convert it to your use or leave it alone. Someone asked me earlier, but how do we persuade ministers to get into the fight? to become more relevant in our fight. And my answer was, no demonstration, no leaflet, no shouting. Let him walk into the pulpit and see empty benches. <laughs> you get the point. Never mind the Jesus message, we want a salvation message relevant to our existence right now. Massage my emotion with Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Give me something concrete that I can live by. Now, looking again at a people at the crossroads I'm turning back to a lesson was taught to me in the Old Harlem History Club by Wilson Huggins, long since dead, protege, I mean Jackson, John Jackson was his protege, and so was I. 
He has said to me, John, we will have no problem getting to the door of the promised land. But we as a people will get to the door of the promised land and bunch up at the threshold and start an argument about whether to cross the threshold with our right foot or our left. And that's where we are right now, arguing at the threshold of liberation. Are we at the threshold of liberation? Our enemy realize that potentially we are the most powerful people in the world. They also realize that we're not going to do to them what they've done to us because we're not going to waste that kind of energy. Of course, we'll knock him off our back. But who in the hell wants Europe? <laughs> if, he wanted, if he wants to keep Europe, keep it with our good wishes. <laughs> but we want every inch of Africa. <laughs> divide nothing there or share nothing there that you're not willing to share with me in Europe. I sure don't share any power. This is why I lost patience with the nonsense about non-racial government in South Africa. Non-racial hell. I want an African government. Anybody can't live on an African government. Oh. The French don't argue about no non-racial government. They want a French-run government. No matter who lives there, it's a French rule government. If you don't like that, you can go home. Don't like their cooking, you can starve or go home. Don't like their law, you can go home. That's the un government I want in Africa. Government so completely controlled by Africans is that it is your prerogative to leave if you don't like it. We'll show you where the airport is. We'll show you where the, if you want to go by boat. We'll show you where the harbor is. If you want to walk, we'll show you where the road is. Be the But we don't share. I don't share no government with me no more than I would willing to share my wife. I ain't no fool. <laughs> and yet you have Africans say, we can share. Where, where did he get his mentality from? Create a non-racial government. White people still control South Africa. White people still control all of the wealth-producing resources in every single African country, and there is no exception. And the same thing as countries away, countries in the West Indies, Canadian Company. I bought up the gold in Guyana. Do you know how much how much Guyana gets out of it? Five percent of the profit of their own gold. Why in the hell didn't they send their young men to the mining schools of the world? Dig the gold yourself. Put it on the markets of the world yourself. And why are the students studying nonsense? Studying management, don't even know what to manage. Why can't we follow the example of the Japanese? They didn't ask their student what they wanted to study. They lined them up and said, geographer for you, medicine for you, oceanography for you, airplane design for you, automotive design for you, locomotive design for you, and you better get it. <laughs> and they got it too. It made Japan a, a modern nation. Right. They lost the war, suffered two atomic bombs. Right. The same people who defeated them are now begging them for right. commercial space yes. in the world. Yes. Not one demonstration, not one leaflet, yes. nobody shouting yellow power. <laughs> You shot at black power, you had no power black or otherwise. I didn't know what power was, still don't know. Power can be had through 
cooperation. You have to stop the silly argument among yourself and cooperate. Somebody's going to have to call the tune. Then you got to sit down, who's best to call the tune? Pick out the most intelligent one, and when that intelligent one works it out, say, okay, we go this way, there's no, no argument. Right. Go that way. That's what the argument at the threshold of liberation is about. How do we go? But some people not only argue, but how do we go, but whether we should go. Some said we should go the Marxist way. Some said we should go the Democratic way. Some said we should go the Republican way. We got to go the Christian way, you know. After all, we got to have the law. <laughs> Somebody else has got to go the Islamic way. The idea is to go. <laughs> we have to stop dividing ourselves based on things fed into our mind by foreigners who fed them into our mind so they can control us. We can take Christianity and convert it into an instrument of liberation that it was supposed to be in the first place. And so with Islam, if you understand Islam, you might think this is a sore spot with me, but anything that demeans the women is so with me. And anything that restricts the presence of the woman is a sore spot with me because we came out of a society where we were willing to let her go as far as her mind could take her without feeling the slight bit insecure. Yes. insecure with black men in power but dead wrong black men who feel insecure with women in power are dead wrong because we didn't base it on men and women we based it on ability and we respected ability there should be no man bashing or women bashing but cooperation between the two now, this is the kind of society we had. That certain ceremonies that couldn't even start until a woman sanctioned it. Because that was a woman's function in that society. Certain ceremonies, she had to function because it related more specifically to her. Now, if you remember the first session of Roots, and on television, but nearly everything was wrong. <laughs> Remember the scene when the boy comes home from ceremony of manhood and circumcision and tells his grandmother, played by Maya Angelou, men don't let women tell them what to do. So you lying fool, you don't even, the people who wrote the script was dead wrong. Alex Haley shouldn't even let that in the script. If he knew the territory he was writing about, he would know that West Africa was Islamized by Islamized Africans. And they were intelligent enough to let the main custom remain intact. And the main custom was then and now. Matt the royal line came down to the female side. In East Africa, the Arabs installed Islam. They destroyed the matrilineal. So East African Islam is different from West African Islam. Go to East Af go to West Africa right now and see who rules the marketplace. Now 
not only women, but women with a society called the Sandy Society. They have their own court judge and jury. And if you wrong one of them and they put you on trial, you don't even know whether your wife is the judge or not. And you will be punished. And you will not get away with anything you do to them. All the stalls owned by men, I mean run by men, owned by women. I went to buy something, one of the stalls, and I had a big bill. And I wanted change, and he called the lady over. I didn't know who she was. She didn't look any different from the other market women. But the woman was a millionaire. See, millionaires here, you be in a stretch Mercedes. <laughs> she walking around in the marketplace, looking at like a regular market woman. Coming over and you know, she picked them, looked my money, made sure it was authentic. <laughs> and she held it in her hands and looked at the person who gave it to me and looked around and I said, I wonder what this is about. I think I can trust you. We went to some place partly secluded, and she opened that big belt on her waist. The lady was padded with money and made the chain. <laughs> I said, you have to look safe, sister, and I admire your industry, but would you tell me uh, in American money just about how much you carry on your sister? <laughs> it since this morning and I've been collecting at my different stalls but it might be from fifty to one hundred thousand dollars in America. I said, aren't you afraid to be wrong? She said, everybody knows me. <laughs> and everybody knows I have money. If anybody touches me, everybody will know who did it. <laughs> And she said, she said, your life would be worth a franc after that. <laughs> Look at the safety now. This is a Muslim country. This is a Muslim woman. Blue in the marketplace. Going for different stalls, all those different stalls that she owns, and collecting money, making change. Carrying from fifty to $100,000 on her waist. No man is disturbed about it in the slightest. No man is propagating, you women are taking over part and everything. No, no, no nonsense like that. Some men are coming up to hope she give them a job. <laughs> I'm saying the best values of society that you created did not die. And while we're getting into European this and European that, we forgot that before the first European war, a shoe a lived in a house that had a window, we already had functioning society before we existed. How can you sit still and hear somebody say he built the pyramids when he hadn't built a shoe for himself in Europe, a house with a window. Or hadn't even written a book. And we're at the crossroads debating something because we have not looked and examined the history of our countries well enough to understand that we have already done what people are saying should be done. And we don't have to argue between Marx and Leninism because we had produced a substance and practiced it long before there was a Europe. There's some confusion between the Karl Marxists and the Groucho Marxists. <laughs> The Groucho's 
seem to be making the most noise. <laughs> While the car marches seem to be in retreat. <laughs> Why don't we tell people, we've been out around this track before. And what you, what you got to say? We never formulized things, we never dogmatized things. We just lived it out. With the first invasion of Africa from Western Asia, in the 1700s, then again in the 1600s, the recovery, the second invasion, my sixth, 65, thereabout, and finally the invasion of Iran, 550, so devastated North East Africa, it opened the door for the Greek Alexander, who began to copy African history, African ceremonies, began to wear the toga. Then the Romans who picked up the idea of the toga from the Africans, stop killing, finally forced Christianity into being through taxation and misery. Finally stopped killing Christians and became Christians for political reasons. And the European is still a Christian for political reasons. And why are we following behind his Christianity, not knowing that his Christianity is some fakery dreamed up at the conference at Nicaea, 325. It is not Christianity at all. It's the handmaiden of his conquest. <clears throat> Finally, he made such a mess of it a camel boy began to grumble, asked for reform. Failing to get reform, he asked for a new religion. This new religion was Islam. Now Africa is in another power track of history. The Africans favored the Arabs at first. The Africans were in Spain. Understand this, because most of you will not read history. The Af were in Spain well entrenched 50 years before the Arabs. The general was Tarak Benazad, known as Jabarel Tarak. The Rock of Gibraltar is named after him. As a classic work written by a Turkish woman, Hale Bagiba. She said the army was as black as ink. The general was blacker still. <laughs> the general was Tyrak Benazad. And she wrote a book bearing his name, Tyrak Benazad. Why did the general look better, look blacker? than the rest of them. His horse was dressed better than the kings of Europe. His horse, silk and brocade. He was, where, he was riding a white horse. The others had another kind of horse that showed off his blackness. <laughs> One day Hollywood might have enough nerve to put that in technical. <laughs> the lady was so impressed. He put off, each one put off a garment and throw it at the feet of the horse. Tell him, I'm available. <laughs> Alpha gonna have to own part of Hollywood before that one is made. <laughs> But that would last almost 800 years. But the rise of Europe after the crusade would put us into another bind. Europe rose 
discover shipbuilding again, started the slave trade, began to scatter Africans throughout the world. They had been scattered voluntarily throughout the world through adventurism and voluntarism. Now they're being scattered as slaves. We're in another bind now. We will not come out of this bind. The 19th century will bring us back to African consciousness again, something now mistakenly called Afrocentricity. It's African consciousness because you should not avoid using the word African, all of it. Don't use no fro. <laughs> but that 19th century in the Caribbean islands with his massive revolts that brought Haiti into being, Africa's anti-colonial wars Winston Churchill said, these Africans who never heard of a military school or wore a store-bought shoe outgeneral some of the finest minds of Europe. Now at the end of the 19th century, Africans began to negotiate, appeal these Christian Africans now appealing to the conscious, the Christian conscious of the Europeans, not knowing he had no Christian conscious. It was lack of Christian conscience that led him into the slave trade. Except in the Pope's word, when the Pope told Spain and Portugal, you are both authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel people. Ed Williams is very good on this. Read his documents in West Indian history. Read his book, The Caribbeans, from Columbus to Castro. And if you forgive the modesty, read my book, Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. The documents are good. Yan Carew's new book, The Conquest of Paradise. That's a book by a white writer called the destruction of paradise. No shortage of information. All you have to do is to read it. Tell you exactly what happened. What happened was not democratic or Christian, our kind. A whole series of nations were destroyed. Indigenous American nations. <coughs> Federated nations, Cherokee nations, Algonquin nations, Crow, Blackfoot, all of these were nations, not tribes. This is the preface to 1619, when they would bring oh, about 20 Africans to Jamestown, Virginia we began our formal induction into the American labor market. We were not the first slaves in America, or the second. They tried to enslave the indigenous Americans. Didn't succeed because he knew the forest, he knew the gully, he knew the river banks, he could slip away. They had more success in enslaving the whites. Read a book by Lerone Bennett called The Shaping of Black America. Read his first two chapters. If you don't read nothing else, read his chapter called First Generation. And read the second chapter called White Servitude. How whites were enslaved too. Then finally, they had to sell the poor whites on the skin game. At first, poor whites had no vested interest in being against blacks. They were poor, they were struggling, 
They were landless. What was the interest in being against blacks? And some of them were indentured servants, as most of the early blacks were indentured servants. They began to marry each other. But after they sold whites on the color scheme, they forbade that kind of relationship one to the other and destroyed it as ruthlessly as they destroyed the white and black farmers' alliance. And the man who destroyed the black and white farmers' alliance later helped to establish the Ku Klux Klan. <clears throat> All of this is forgotten. All this 19th century struggle with Douglas, forgotten. The 19th century struggle in Africa, when Africans did not negotiate anything. They took their spear and their shield and went to the battlefield and negotiated in blood. <laughs> They announced that negotiation through their manhood. At the end of the 19th century, missionary trained Africans, Caribbean islands, Africa, Christian Africans in the United States began the whole track of appealing to the Christian conscience of people who wasn't Christian in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now they would start the Pan-African Congress, started by a Caribbean lawyer, H. Sylvester Williams. <clears throat> it is a bit of irony that the three great Pan-Africanists all came from Trinidad, H. Sylvester Williams, C.L.R. James, George Padmore. I never knew H. Sylvester Williams. I knew James. We were friends and colleagues and to the day he died. I knew George Padmore in the United States, and I knew him again in Ghana when I was there in 1958. I asked him a question. He told me, stop meddling in his foreign business, in, in, in his personal business. I say, of all of you who are pan-African is wanting the unification of the African world, All three of you have had children by a black woman that you never married. None of you have established a long relationship with a black woman. Where is your pan-Africanism when the door is closed and the bed is ready? <clears throat> Man, stop meddling. My personal business is my personal business. I left it there. It's a contradiction. And yet, all three men made a major contribution to the concept of the unification of African people. Du Bois, who never liked being called the father of Pan-Africanism, because it was incorrect. Du Bois was a guardian of truth, and he wanted to be called the guardian or the keeper of the Pan-African tradition. He never said he was the God, he was the founder of anything, and he wasn't, and he didn't pretend that he was. But his over-enthusiastic followers gave him credit for a lot of things he did not do, failed to give him credit for a lot of things he did do. Intellectually, Du Bois was the finest example 
of a functioning intellect we have produced in the whole of the Western world. As we entered the 20th century, we entered the 20th century <coughs> with a debate. The debate was over pan-Africanism and nationalism. The debate was over something we haven't even settled today. What kind of education we need for tomorrow? What kind of education we need for our children? We were debating between Booker T. Washington's approach and Du Bois's approach. We were wrong then, we are wrong now. Both Du Bois and Booker T. Washington was right. They were, did not con contradict each other. Both were speaking out of their respective environments and background. Booker T. Washington, born a slave, And from his background, he never seen his father, but he suspected he was white because he was a little less than black. <laughs> du Bois, a New England aristocrat, and you can be a New England aristocrat without having money. Good family, good education, good manners, good friends, hadn't disgraced yourself publicly or private, so you're an aristocrat. So he was accepted. Du Bois wanted to go to Harvard as, as the young men of that town, a socialist town. There used to be whole socialist towns in America where the education of the brightest young men were taken care of by the town. Knowing that he got the high marks and good to both and well thought of, knowing for sure he would go to Harvard, they sent him to Fisk. And there Du Bois discovered who he was. His white friend, including girlfriend. Now he discovered he must enter race work. The best thing that could have happened to him, it shocked him out of his illusions. <laughs> He knew that was a dividing line. And he began his race work. Eventually he would go to Harvard. He would finish his PhD thesis there, a work still worth reading, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States, published in the Harvard series of books by students. 1903, he would publish a little work that should be the preface to understanding Du Bois, Souls of Black Folks. And one essay, not criticizing Booker T. Washington, but taking some exception to some of the things Booker T. Washington has done. You, why don't we just get the book? You can read it in less than an evil, evening. Why don't we just read? Souls of black folks, don't take my word for it. I want you to check me out. I want you to try to find me wrong because I know you can't do it. I read his gift of black folks. Then 1915, read his classic essay, Africa in the War. Then read his little book called The Negro, a general survey of African people in the world, doing exceptionally well what I've been trying to do in a condensed form, give you a picture of African people functioning in a global situation by the basic headquarters of African people throughout the world is Africa itself. So long as we are shy about identifying with Africa, we got a problem that's not going to be solved. Italians never shy of identifying with Italy. Germans are not shy of identifying with Germany. 
The word German America is longer than the word African American. You can say that. Your tongue don't fall out. <laughs> no, you got to abbreviate it. Afro. They ain't no fro. <laughs> so therefore, Afrocentricity is a personal exercise. But if it has any meaning at all, it must be called African centricity. That's right. Then if it's called African centricity, it has to broaden its base. It must include the great 19th century radicals. It must include a good analysis of the man who's been called the father of black nationalism, Martin Delaney. It must include an analysis of his work, the condition and elevation of the colored race. It must include his work of the history of the concept of race and how it developed. It must include Frederick Douglass. It must include Frederick Douglass with some kind of honesty. Too many times, the whole women live movement want to dismiss Douglas because he was exactly as kind to his black wife as he should have been. All right, I'm sympathetic toward his black wife. <laughs> but that don't change one eye order of Douglas's force, the clarity of his analysis, and the program of the fight he left for us and his great legacy. Right. The music of Mozart is not less sweet and melodious because he beat his wife, although I'm sympathetic toward the wife. I don't see why any man should beat any woman when he can vote with his feet and walk away. Makes no sense to me. But if you're going to go into that 19th century, you got to deal with this awakening of African consciousness. William Wells Brown, our first novelist, his book about Ethiopia, other books about Ethiopia. You got to do an analysis of George Washington Williams, two volume history of black America, and how he held the African question and brought up the question of the elimination of the word Negro. I'm saying Malefi Asante has made a contribution to our consciousness and our direction, but he's merely started and he's neglected too many monumental figures in our history, too many monumental contributors to our history. Our argument started in the 19th century with the Pan-African Congress, but let me conclude this before the Baptist preacher in me gets the best of me and I talk forever. <laughs> we went wrong when we failed to understand of all the Pan-African Congresses, the most significant one was the Pan-African Congress in Manchester, England, 1945, convened by Kwame Nkrumah, George Padmore, Namde Zigwe, John Stone Kenyatta, later Jomo Kenyatta, because that is the Congress that planned the independent explosion of Africa. The other Congress were begging for the right for Africa to have the kind of education that will equip them to rule themselves. In 1945, these conferees said, we are ready now. We are ready to rule ourselves now. We want independence now. Finally, Nkrumah 
is brought home and became head of the pre-colonial government and eventually head of the state. And this frightened all of the colonial powers because if Africa became head of that country, start controlling their mental wealth, they could close down Western industry. They had to stop this in a hurry. So they began to overthrow government after government until they finally overthrew Nkrumah. They'd already killed off Lumumba. Sooner or later, the Pan-Africans from the North, Nasser, would be gone. Ben Bella would be imprisoned. Now we're at the crossroads debating again direction, debating someone else's ism, forgetting something that Europeans, irrespective of religious belief, irrespective of political belief, main interest in Africa was to control Africa. They had no other mission. And the left wanted to control Africa as much as the right. So we need not get into game played in the name of political opportunists and Johnny come lately called Marx and Lenin. They, they too were playing a European game a game for European control. They not only did not know anything about the cultures and the politics and the people of Africa, they did not know what they needed to know about the people of Europe. Otherwise, Russia would not be at war with some of her own colonies. Had she recognized the culture difference and the religious difference in these colonies, these people were willing to stay within the Russian orbit, but not willing for anybody to dictate everything to them and use their resources at the same time. Russia could have yielded something to them and still kept them as partners and treated them with some equality. They could have created a socialist or communist parliament for Europe, recognizing each state as independent associated and treated with the Soviet Union. But they had to make the stupid mistake of declaring that Russia is officially an atheistic nation. I have no great love for the organized religions of the world, including Hindu, that created the concept of untouchability. <laughs> Yet I'm a strong spiritual human being. I know that there's a spiritual force in the universe. And one of my students asked, Professor Clark, in as much as you don't believe in organized religions, where do you think you're going to go when you die? I said, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to live in what I did, live in who I taught, the bury the man, continue the plan. I would no more live without spirituality being a part of my being than I would get on all fours and walk with the dogs. For it is spirituality, not religion, that lifts me higher than the dog. Now when I can make the seasons change, make the oceans roar, start a hurricane and stop one, I will tell you I no longer believe in God. Because when I can do that, I will be God. I know I will never do that. So while 
I do not believe in organized religions because all of them are hypocritical. I believe in love people. I believe in myself. And I have a special love for my own people whose fight I've been involved in most of the years of my life. And for them, I've only gone to jail for very honorable reasons, like leading a riot or something, nothing. <laughs> I've not disgraced myself. And I look good once they examine me and told me. There'll be nothing in my whole life that you need to feel apologetic for. I have considered myself to be a part of and part of the ownership of African people and struggle, and I have never been outside of that struggle. Our Holocaust need to be mentioned here in conclusion, because it was not only the death of so many of us, it was the death of aspirations. It was the death of hope. It was the death of possibilities. It was the death of dreams unfulfilled. I am saying, this did not end at all. We will live through what we leave behind for our children and what they subsequently will leave behind for that children. We have suffered the longest and most brutal holocaust in human history. 100 times worse than that internal family affair in Europe. <laughs> Faith has spared us for something. Faith has not spared us to feed poison in our veins. Faith has not spared us to douse our bodies with alcohol and die and die in a drunken stupor. Faith has spared us to deliver a message to ourself and to all mankind. We need not burn anyone's church or demean anyone's religion. But when it touches our lives, we need to convert it into an instrument of liberation and we need to stop worrying about who cares about what we do so long as we are clear that this is what we want to do for our liberation. We need more independent schools. We need an independent political school or political association. We need something to pres preserve the languages of Africa. There shouldn't be a black child over 10 who is not skillful in computers, in math, and in science. You have to instill into this child from birth. You are born to lead. You are born to bring a new son to a people. Cast away, brought out of their homes against their will. You're born to dig so deep into your history, you can tell the world with accuracy. Long before there was a Europe, African people created the philosophical thought that went into the making of what you think is Greek philosophy, but is nothing but African philosophy. <clears throat> African people, again, created the spiritual thought that went into the making of the Bible, something you have written into myth and lied about. We gave the world its first humanity. And if faith spared us to give the world its first humanity, then our great message to the world is a message of enduring humanity for all mankind and remember, and teach your children to remember.
and to have confidence. If we did it once, we can, of course, do it again. Thank you.